So in this project, we've got a 14 foot by 14 foot deck and it's elevated off the ground. It's using some posts to offset the distance where the sonotubes are coming up through the ground. Now, number nine, where it shows the sonotube itself, it's truncated, it's a four foot deep sonotube. And what we're going to do is we're going to assign the tasks and the order of preferences of tasks. So we're determining the predecessors. What is the order of operation in order to determine our scheduling, how we're going to actually construct this. So all of the elements here are numbered and then they're labeled below and what they actually are going to be named. So let's go through the actual sequence of events. In order to do the critical path, we have to determine what are the first elements that need to be done and what are independent elements that can be done at any time. So looking at this particular project, what we have to do is we have an existing house condition and we have to remove siding to get at the actual uh, exposed structure of the house. So here's an example of the siding being removed. And in this particular case, they've actually exposed some of the wood sheathing as well. And that's why you see the insulation. So we have to rip this down right down to the plywood or the sheathing underlay. This would be the rim board. That edge would actually be the subflooring that is in the house. And this is what's referred to as the base plate or the sill plate for the wall framing. Now, in our particular condition, we also typically have at this point an air barrier and the air barrier is there designed specifically to prevent the migration of air very quickly in and out of the house. So that's not shown here. It may be this top layer here has been cut and that was part of the air barrier, but all of this has to be restored in construction. Once that air barrier is in place, we have to provide flashing. And the flashing is to remove the water from the house and onto the deck surface or behind the deck surface. So this is the ledger install, but it's really designed to show you how the flashing goes over top of the ledger strip. So water coming down the side of the house has to then flash into or migrate towards the deck or outer part of the house. Any water that creeps into the house and the house gets damaged, you're actually liable for and you it's something that we don't want to get involved in so we want to make sure that we're properly shedding the water away from the home this is a an example of the flashing being installed it's a copper flashing that's put over top of the ledger strip so the ledger strip has to be installed but in this particular case we're going to expose the siding install the flashing and then put in the ledger strip we're going to use a slightly different technique um, so the order of operation is critical and how many people work on the project at that time. And so you can see what they've done in here. They've got a secondary piece of flashing to make sure any of the, uh, the water that runs down the doorway or the opening will then leach onto the actual flashing and then onto the deck surface itself. So in task number one is exposing the siding. T task number two is installing the flashing. In this example, the flashing is brought right through and down along the, the exposed sheathing house and then the ledger strip is installed. So depending on which technique you're using determines the order of operations. Now the ledger strip to attach it, which in our case is uh, item number three or task number three, has to be secured to the rim board that's inside the house. And we saw that rim board right here. I'm just going to go back one more right here. This is the rim board that's attached to the side of the house. And these are the internal joists and the subfloor that's um, in the home itself. So this is something that we have to make sure that that attachment is solid to the home. It can't just be drilled into the side of the house anywhere. It has to be attached solidly. And in this particular case, the flashing runs straight down instead of lipping over the ledger board. So again, depending on the technique that you're going to be using, that's what you're going to install. Now, in this particular case, I'm showing this example only because it's brick. Brick is a unique unique thing because there's actually an air gap, a one inch air gap between the back of the brick and that sheathing piece. So wherever we have any sort of uh, attachment, in this case bolts, we actually pr have to provide solid wood backing behind it to make sure that when these bolts are tightened, we don't push in the brick surface. But that's something that we don't have in this particular case. If we do have a condition where there's brick and we don't want to attach it to the brick, we can provide independent posts to support that ledger board. And then it can actually support the, the joist and then the decking material above it as well. So there's different techniques that we can use to do this. This is what we're trying to avoid. And this is obviously uh, a project where the deck was not secured properly to the side of the house. So once again, in this case, we rip off the siding, 
we exposed here, the red color is the actual Tyvek material or the house wrap itself will provide uh, primary flashing. This one's actually showing a secondary flashing laid down on top of this flashing again to provide that uh, watershed. Then it goes right over top of that board, the ledger strip to make sure that the water is removed. So the next item that we have on our list, let me just go here. I don't know if I can increase the size. I will try to. It's going to, it's a poor image, is we've got to dig holes. Now, these are the things that we need to understand can be done independently. So somebody could be working on the house, taking off the siding, exposing all the elements, putting in the flashing, the ledger board, and somebody else could be digging the holes. So this is an example of the holes being dug. That's task number four for our project. And then once the holes are actually dug, I have to bring this back to its original size, we can then start putting in some form work. So this is showing you a number of tasks going on at the same time. So the form work we have here is task number five, and it can be done and poured individually and then the sauna two placed on top, in which case we'd have rebars over it. They've chosen in this example to do everything at once, and it's very difficult because you have to make sure things are centered vertically uh, perfect, placed in the right location, and then pour everything at once, as is the case here. Here, this is a more substantial uh, footing and sauna tube installation where there's uh, some massive rebar point going through the center of it and tying into the footing. And they've used the formwork to get the general shape, but then the earth itself as the formwork for the construction. But the formwork has to be in place before you actually pour the footing. And so therefore the formwork is task number five. Task number six is the pouring of the footing. Now in this particular case, there's no real footing. They just put in gravel because there wasn't that much load and the soil could sustain it. So they've just put the sauna tube on top, leveled it and made sure it's vertical just by putting in some temporary supports, pouring it, and then just putting in a saddle to support the post. So this is showing the sequence. The other thing we can do is we can provide some sort of bell footing, which is just a wider bottom or base. And that's done by um, when you're using the auger and you get near the bottom is you're rocking the auger in uh, a rotational sort of formwork. And that will dig out a bit of a bell shaped base to give a larger area along the bottom of the sauna tubes. Uh, and uh, therefore provide more support against heat. You can also buy formwork that is already in that shape. So depending on the technique you use determines the task number and the operation that you're going to go in. What we're gonna do is dig the hole, put in the footing formwork, pour the footing, so pouring the footing is task number six. Install the sauna tube, make sure it's nice and level, that's task number seven. Then pour the concrete post in the sauna tubes. So this is more of the operation where we place the formwork and then we'll pour concrete in the formwork, put in some rebars. And again, here's an example where it's done all at once and that's a bit more expensive to do. What we cannot do is use deck blocks, okay? In Canada, this is illegal. You can't place your deck just on top of the ground. Frost will get underneath it, heave it, do all sorts of things to it, so we can't do that. Once we have poured the concrete posts, we set the saddle supports, and this is what will support the posts that go above it. And setting the saddles is task number nine for us, and there's different types of saddles. This one is an offset saddle, so it's got a one inch gap, and what that allows it to do is that any water that comes down the, the actual post will drain off without sitting at the bottom of the post and potentially rotting the post and they're tightly secured into the support and you can see the offset distance and the gap that's in there and it's nicely set into the center of the column you can also use a saddle that just has a rebar at the base of it and that provides enough support but what's important is that we set these things at the right heights so that when we install the post on top of them they're nice level e even right into the center of the sauna tube so we, task number 10 is setting these wood posts to make sure um, it, they're done correctly. I like this technique because then after you set the posts, you can then cut them to the right heights. So this is a better technique than, for me, I think it's easier than bringing the sauna tube all the way up to the other side of the beam. Now there's some extra mechanicals that are involved in that, but you can really get a perfectly accurate, I think it's more user friendly and less likelihood of having some problems. So we have to set the posts into the saddles and 
once we do that, we'll then level the post by cutting them to the right height. Now, the posts are gonna support a beam. It's a built-up wood beam. The built-up wood beam is a process that you do on site. So it can actually happen at any time. We could do that way before we get to the point, point of installing it. So again, it's an independent task that could start at any time. It's not part of the critical path. So we're calling that task number 12, just for the sake of giving it a number. And then once we've built that, we'll set that onto the actual posts themselves. And this is an example of the posts sitting on top of them. Again, I apologize, some of these images are rather small, but you get a sense of what's going on here so that you can see the different types of support mechanisms that they have in place here. Okay, then we have to attach the posts to the beam. Now, there's some decorative elements I think are really attractive these days, especially when you've got a suspended deck that's at a pretty good height. And this is nice because the post can actually be slightly narrower than the beam. So it has a bit of an offset built into this that allows us to set the beam onto the post and provide all the proper support. So, it, and it's attractive. It's not that shiny, glossy, galvanized steel that really is a bit of an eyesore, whereas this is something that's pre-finished to look pretty good. So once your beams are set, your ledger board's in place, the flashing's installed, some of the siding is returned to its restored position, you're ready to hang the actual joists themselves. So we have to attach them. We're going to use basically joist hangers along the ledger, and you can see the different supports that they were used to attach. And you should have two bolts minimum in each bay or at 16 inch centers in between. And this is a great example showing how these things are already preset, ready to go. And then they're just sitting on top of the beam. Here's an example where the beams have extra support cross braces. And we learned this much earlier that the cross brace will actually reduce the span of the beam. And this is another installation that will support that. And we can easily put the joists from the joist hanger to across the beam. And we just drop them into the hangers, nail them in place. And there we have an installation of, in this case, the actual ledger is attached through the brick and they would have to provide the support in between the brick and then they just lay the joists right into the hangers themselves. Once the uh, joists are attached, this task number 14, we then attach the rim board and the rim board is task number 15. You'll notice that all the end cuts, and this is typically you put in all the joists and then you'll straighten out the cut right along the end are then finished off with the pressure treated chemicals that are used to protect the ends of the wood. And then we attach the rim board to that outer edge. So the rim board is task number 15. Task number 16 is installing all the blocking. So in this case, they've got blocking set up for their edge treatment. So you can see they've installed the blocking sideways to provide a larger surface support for the edge treatment. They've got the holes for the posts in this particular case. Now, Here's an example when you start getting into some fancy curves or some of the material now, the composite materials that have inlays and the type of blocking you have to do. It's quite extensive, but that's what's required to provide the correct support uh, for what we're doing here. So the blocking in our particular case is task number 16. And then from there, we can set the handrails. And the handrails we're going to use one of the techniques that is approved by um, SB7, the Ontario Building Code documentation on posts and installation of posts. And whether we use a technique like that or any of the ones that um, are indicated that are similar to this, again, you have to refer the documentation, the SB7 documentation to get it absolutely correct. That's what we're doing. We're setting these posts. That needs to happen once those joists are in place, the rim boards in place, we can set the posts and then we can set the handrails and the pickets and the top rails. So we have the three different elements that are here. And while we're setting this, so these are tasks number 18, 19, and 20. W while we're doing this, we can actually be installing the deck at the same time. So the deck installation task number 21 can be occurring before the completion of the handrails being installed as well. So we have all sorts of different conditions and here's an example of using composite board and what they've done in here to get a nice finished width of the board is they've started on the outside 
and they're going to work their way on the inside. And imagine, if you will, if you're working on a project like this, once these outer boards are done, somebody else could be actually installing the handrail. So even though the tasks are sequential, there's a number of elements that have to be in place, and they're numbered that way, there's some overlap. And that's what we've got to consider when we're working on a project like this. What are the overlaps? Now, even here, I can see the flashing in the, the actual air barrier placed behind it. And it looks like they're going to finish that last strip of the siding at the end, once all the boards are in. And that makes sense here because they want to get a nice, clean edge. And they want the board to overlap the edge of the decking as well. So albeit we've selected a specific way of tasking this project for the purposes of developing a schedule, there are some variations and flexibilities to it. And depending on which technique you use, will also determine what the order of tasks are, what the predecessors are, what the duration is, and how long it's going to take us to complete the project.